So th uh, thank you, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Victor Thompson. I'm a professor in the Department of Anthropology. I'm also the director of the Laboratory of Archaeology, and, and I'm going to introduce our speaker here, Dr. David Hurst Thomas. And uh, I pointed out to him earlier that this was the fourth time I had introduced him, and to which he quickly replied, well, you got to get it right this time. So, and hopefully, hopefully I'll get a little bit of it right, um, because there's a lot to say about Dr. Thomas's career, uh, and especially as it relates to the archaeology and indigenous history of St. Catherine's Island. A um, little bit first, he <clears throat> has served since 1972 as a curator of anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Uh, for seven years, he was chairman of the Department of Anthropology, taught at Columbia University, New York University, University of California, Davis, University of Florida, Nevada, City College of New York, and has lectured in uh, more than 40 countries. He is a specialist in Native American archaeology. He holds degrees from the University of California, Davis, PhD 1971, and a Doctor of Science, honorary, honorary Doctor of Science from the University of South, uh, that was conferred in 1995. In 1970, he discovered Gate Cliff Shelter, Nevada, which is the deepest archaeological rock shelter in the Americas. Thomas also uh, found and continues to excavate the 16th or 17th century Franciscan mission Santa Catalina de Wale in St. Catherine's Island, which we'll speak about today. Uh, he also led excavations, uh, excavation seasons at Mission St. Marcos, uh, now Santa Fe, New Mexico. He is a member of the Writers Guild and is has countless accolades for his writings. Um, in fact, they're just, we wouldn't get to hear him talk if I read all the, these things. Um, but I would like to point out that he is the author, co-author, editor uh, of numerous books and publications that have define the discipline of archaeology, including uh, being the author of one of its premier textbooks, um, which I checked out as a young undergraduate from the University of Georgia uh, when I thought this was going to be the early 90s and read it cover to cover. It was my first introduction to his work. And it was uh, really a defining moment, I think, in a lot of young archaeologists' careers. That book, and in fact, I recommended it to a high school student just the other day. Um, his archaeological research has been featured in New York Times, National Geographic, uh, Natural History, uh, Archaeology, Museum Magazine. There's been a half-hour film by National Geographic, among other uh, noteworthy news outlets that have covered uh, Dr. Thomas's career uh, through throughout the whole time that he's been doing research. In 1989, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, uh, recognition considered, you know, to be one of the honorary apex of the American scientific community. Um, we could say only maybe the Nobel Prize. I don't, there's not a Nobel Prize for archaeology. Yeah, so that's the apex, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, in recognition of his research at Mission Santa Catalina de Wally, Thomas received the Franciscan, Franciscan Institute Medal in 1992, the only non-Franciscan ever to be honored. Uh, in March 2014, he was unanimously elected as the Fellow of the American um, Academy of American Franciscan History, one of six fellows that year. And Thomas was also awarded the Presidential Recognition Award by the Society for American Archaeology, the Founders Lifetime Achievement Award from the Great Basin Anthropological Association, and the Frixell Award uh, for interdisciplinary research by the Society for American Archaeology in 2014. Um, in 2017, he received the Society of American Archaeology's Lifetime Achievement Award. I think that's enough for me about Dr. Thomas's career. So please welcome him to give this lecture, Indigenous Georgians in European Survivance at Mission Santa Catalina de Wale, 1570. I'll leave it over to you.
Well, okay, Victor. <laughs> we doing okay on the sound back there? Okay, Victor, that was pretty good for number five. However, the next time you do it, it will be called Nevada, not Nevada, uh, as our fest far westernists uh, get pretty prickly about. Um, thank you for that. And let me just say what a pleasure it is to be here, back, of course, on Georgia soil, but particularly to return to the Hargret Library. I was here years ago and did a lecture in this very room when we transferred our archival material uh, from St. Catharines to here. And it's remarkable to see what's happened in the meantime. I hadn't seen the show before tonight. And I'm really blown away with what you've done. Uh, it's going to be something I'm going to recommend uh, all these former students and employees. But more than that, the message that you're getting across in there is exactly the one that we're so glad to see. And so uh, your show tells three stories. The first is about the written records, the documents, which is the way that most of us know Euro-American history by reading the documents. That's history. The second thing it does is show the archeological evidence for it's the material part of that same history that many people don't have any idea about because it's hard to find out about. Your show helps that. And the third and also important one is the importance of descendants from those from that history that we're talking about. And that's part of what I'm, I'm gonna talk about all three of those tonight, but particularly with, with the descendant communities uh, both Franciscan and the indigenous Georgians who were forced off this land during that period of colonial settlement. And they're part of your show as well, working through. So congratulations on that. Uh, I've taken, I don't know how many pictures to show all the people who've worked on St. Catharines with me all those years. And I'm very proud of what you have done. And I'm proud to be here. Now, why would anybody have heard of St. Catharines? You showed up at a lecture, so I imagine you know something about it. But just in the, in the popular mind, what is it about St. Catharines? Uh, there are three footnotes in history that are worth remembering. St. Catharines. Oh, and Island in Time. Uh, that's a book I, I did a couple editions here at the University of Georgia Press that is so vastly out of date, uh, I'm, I'm not recommending it. But the three footnotes in history that I do want to mention are certainly Mary Musgrove. She was a Creek woman of the Wynn clan, and she worked so closely with Oglethorpe over those early years in establishing Savannah and Georgia colony that she ended up making helping make a peaceful transformation between the Creek nation and the newcomers. And when it was over, she thought that she might be worth more than the hourly salary she got. So she said that the, the Creek Nation owns three of those sea islands, Osaba, St. Catharines, and Sapelo, and she wants them back. So she ended up taking it to court, two courts, one in Britain and one in Savannah, and she won. So two of the islands were sold, and she made St. Catherine's Island her home until she died, where she is buried. Many of you know the story of Button Gwinnett, of course. He lived on St. Catherine's for a while, and although not an international star politically, his autograph, there are only 51 of them known, is the highest price autograph in the world, except maybe Shakespeare, and we'll see about the next auction on that one. Button Gwinnett lived on St. Catharines for a while, and it's not impossible that he might be buried there. And the third is Mission Santa Catalina, and that's what I'm talking about tonight. It is certainly buried on St. Catharines, and the problem is it was pretty hard to find. But St. Catharines goes beyond just, just local Georgia history. If you look at the map, it's situated right in the middle between James, the later colony at Jamestown and the early, earlier Spanish colony at St. Augustine. 
So St. Catharines, for about a century after Santa Elena fell in South Carolina, became the northern outpost of the Spanish Empire along the Atlantic seaboard, an incredibly important pivotal point between the Spanish world and the British world that was engulfing the native, native Georgians. The problem is that nobody knew where it was. It had flat out disappeared. It was founded in the 1560s, probably. It was certainly abandoned in the 1680s. And for the next 300 years, there was one sighting of it 10 years after its abandonment, and that was it. So historians and treasure hunters and several others have gone looking for St. Catharines, including the six archaeological teams that I'm showing you here, starting with C.C. Jones in the 1850s. I was fortunate to be the last one on this list. Uh, in, in 1943, Edward John Noble bought St. Catharines Island. He's even a bigger footnote, in, or smaller footnote in the history. He's known for inventing the hole in the lifesaver, beech nut candy. And not only was it a great marketing device, but think of all that candy that saved. Well, that worked into a world of uh, business for Mr. Noble. He bought the island when he died in the uh, 1950s. The Edward John Noble Foundation took charge of St. Catherine's Island. And I was fortunate enough in 1974 to be asked to go to St. Catherine's and among other things, to see what I could do about finding that lost Spanish mission. Now, looking for St. Catherine's, as I say, has gone on, had gone on for 300 years. And what exactly are we looking for here? Well, we weren't looking for Spanish garbage. We'd found Spanish garbage, and so had archaeologists working there before, including the University of Georgia and Joseph Caldwell. Uh, we didn't want to find the garbage. We wanted to find where Spanish gar garbage wasn't, and that would give us a place. We wanted to find the church. We wanted to find the oldest church in Georgia, and that's, that's what we set out to do. Now, I, my background, I'm, I'm from the West Coast. I'm from California, Nevada, Nevada, Victor. Uh, we knew how to find things in the desert. You can find a, a 10,000 year old Folsom Point and a, and a Coors beer can next to each other and they're exactly where they were dropped uh, 10,000 years apart. In Georgia, of course, you can't see your feet. So it's an entirely different challenge, but the principles are the same. I'm a big believer in probability theory. And I thought what we need to do when we, come to, we came to the island, let's random sample that sucker. Let's look at 20% and particularly, let's look in places where we don't want to look. Uh, and so that's exactly what we did. Sample 20% found about 200 archaeological sites. We estimate there are about 700 on the island overall. But what it particularly told us is where the Spanish were not. And then we could focus in and do a better job. Now, this is back, this is the late 70s. We're not talking about yesterday. But it was clear even then that remote sensing, non-invasive archaeology is going to be the wave of the future. And so we employed some extraordinarily primitive versions of the same archaeology that Victor's students learn today. And they're all, it's, it's a way of life. It's a part of the toolkit of archaeologists today. It wasn't back then. And if you look real close on this left-hand shot, you'll see Irv Garrison, who came to us and helped us with a proton magnetometer survey back in the Miocene. Uh, before he actually before he came to the University of Georgia, but we at least tried these non-invasive techniques to see how well they worked, and it turned out they worked really well. The very first excavation that we did on the island came down on a 16th century Spanish well. It's a three-barrel well. They take the knock the ends out and stack them up, totally invisible, the way we were accustomed to doing archaeology, but it popped right out. 
in the geophysics. So bingo, <clears throat> we're not just with Spanish garbage anymore. We're talking structurally about maybe we've got something better going here. And the second excavation that we had confirmed it. We came down right on the mission kitchen. And so feeling pretty confident, we after the, went after the third one. And I have to say, Irv Garrison told us to dig these three places based on his, his work there. We came right down on the mission church. Bingo. George's oldest church was laid out. And what you're looking at is the plan of that. The walls have fallen over. There's a shell plaza in front of it. It's about 14 inches down, covered by hurricane debris and stuff but in perfect shape. It's never been plowed. It's an archeologist dream. And although it took us five years to find it, I would say that today's students trained here in the UGA lab would find it half that time, but that's how far we've come. Okay, so we've got archeology span going. It's working very well. It's taken us a while. We've got a foundation. We've got a landscape interested in pursuing all of that. <clears throat> but there are a couple of things, protocols, that you need to do. And the first, oh, forgot this slide. Fun to find stuff. That's what archaeologists do. Now come the protocols. The first thing call I made in 1981 when we had found that church was to Bishop Raymond Lassard in the Savannah Diocese. And I said, Bishop Lassard, I believe we found something that belongs to you. And he said, what? And I said, the oldest church in Georgia, and it's Catholic. And he said, it better be. And my question was, do you have an issue with our doing archaeological excavations on this? And he said, no, I don't have a problem with that. The souls have departed. It's time to do that. Now, there's one lesson in here. I joined every archaeologist and every historian in assuming that the Wally people, Mission Santa Catalina Day Wally of the Wally people, that they were extinct. And we were wrong. They're not extinct. And if we were doing this today, we would have a very different level of consultation with the living descendants of those but it was a one-way street uh, in 1981. So that was the first one. Bishop Lassard, shown I one slide back here, and I talked about it a lot. It was okay. He wanted to send the nuns over to, to film us doing it, but we talked a little deeper. What is this? Well, it's not only the oldest church in Georgia, but it's really significant in Catholic history. Do we just... What do we do? Just call it an archaeological site. And we agreed that, no, it's something that's so important for the Catholic, modern Catholic Church. Let's do something better. And I just come back. Uh, uh, I was on a trip and stopped at Pearl Harbor, where my dad had served. And I was at the Arizona. And here is a ship, 900 people still in it, on the bottom of Pearl Harbor. It's not a commission ship in the U.S. Navy, but it still has the right to fly the flag. And that's the conversation we have. Isn't that a lot like Mission Santa Catalina on St. Catharines? And he agreed. So what this slide shows is 1984, when he is, in effect, reconsecrating this site and its importance going forward. We're fortunate, uh, Royce Hayes, who's in the audience here and was superintendent for 30 years on St. Catharines, has a degree in forestry from the University of Georgia and helped in innumerable ways to help us work on this. But his key idea was, what do we do when we walk away? It looks like just a big construction site. Well, why don't we take a cabbage palm, a big one, and put it on each of the main posts of the mission itself? And that's what we're looking at here. It is literally a living church that was established before, and it's still there, just in a different form. So anybody can walk into that, and you have the feeling of the magnitude of what happened there 400 years ago. Now, there's another responsibility. That's the responsibility to the descendant communities. There's another responsibility, I think, 
to the local communities. And at the time, we talked about these collections. Now, I'm lucky enough to work at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. It's the largest natural history museum in the world. And our collections number in the millions. Why should, we just made the decision. What comes from Georgia stays in Georgia. It's more important to have it here than to have it in our huge storage areas in New York. So we did. So what you're seeing is President Jimmy Carter in 2006 about looking at the artifacts from St. Catherine's Island. Uh, some of them are pictures in the exhibit here and getting ready to tell the people at Fernbank Museum of Natural History in Atlanta, you've just received a collection from St. Catherine's Island and from the Edward John Noble Foundation comes from Georgia, stays in Georgia, and stays at Fernbank. So they've had a number of exhibitions. And the second part of that story, that seemed to work pretty well. So we did it again. And we had a competition. Uh, Victor's group won it. It came to the University of Georgia, and there were two parts. One is the archaeological facility that I got to go out and tour today, which was just an old stair... A storehouse when I first saw it. And they've done a wonderful job in, in putting that together where any qualified person can go in and take a look at that collection. And the other part was the archive that came here to the Hargret Library. And for the first time, you're seeing some of our original stuff that we transferred shown in really, I think, a remarkable way. Okay. Now, Victor mentioned my textbooks. Um, and that, that I didn't prod him to do that. I was going to talk about this anyway, but I've written a dozen or so textbooks. And if I had a choice when they close the book, the one thing I want them to walk away with is not all the specifics of radiocarbon dating and all that stuff. It's not just what you find as an archeologist. It's what you find out. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, is what we found out more recently about St. Catharines and the people who lived there. Okay, begging the question. So you've done all this archaeology, we've done all this historical research. What does that tell us about, really tell us, about deep Georgia history? Well, of course, it tells us there's a lot more that extends before 1733, but we're still learning things. There's uh, an essence of, of what's going on there. Archaeology is a team sport. You have a dig. It attracts a lot of attention. Things are coming to light that have not been seen in hundreds, sometimes thousands of years. It's a life-changing experience for the people who are actually excavating those. There's a bond between something that is there and the first person to see it in hundreds or thousands of years. That's a lot of what archeology span does. Team sport, lots of people involved. And we were fortunate enough, people wanna come and see a dig like that. And St. Catharines is a little hard to get to. Uh, it's a tough ticket. You've gotta be a scientist or have connections somehow there. It's a long boat ride, but we were fortunate to be able to work with the very best historians of that Spanish period. Gene Lyon, Paul Hoffman, Amy Bushnell, Michael Francis, all of them visited the mission site while we were exposing these things and said, we want to be involved. I think the stuff you're finding needs, we need to go back and take another look at the historical records. And that's exactly what they did. So in the process of not only doing moving the dirt in archaeology, we were also moving the dirt in the historical records and getting fresh eyes on things that had kind of been taken for granted. So what did we find out? Well, one thing we found out <clears throat> is good old Santa Catalina, the mission site itself, was if the king of Spain would have walked on it, he would have been pleased. It's exactly what the ordinances of the Indies from about 20 years earlier said. They laid out, see, the Spanish were thinking, we're establishing utopia 
in a new world. How do we get utopia right? And so what we do is build cities, not like we have in Spain, but like the way they should be. And so that is exactly what we're seeing at Mission Santa Catalina. You are seeing a town plan laid out in the ordinances. In the middle is a plaza. And the thing down here labeled building one is the church. All the sacred stuff goes on one side of the plaza. All the secular stuff goes on the other. Two is the kitchen. Uh, four is, is the convento. And surrounding here is a community of maybe a thousand people who are living in streets. And this is the way they laid it out. And it's reprised thousands of times throughout Latin America. This was exactly what the Spanish were trying to do here. And there's been a lot of doubt about whether this ever translated to missions. It translated perfectly at St. Catherine's. And that was a big surprise to us all. Now, what else do we find out? Well, except not except for this, but we found out that St. Catharines does not correspond to lots of things everywhere else in New Spain. And New Spain's a big place. It's Mexico and a lot of Central America and the West Indies, the American Southwest and Texas and Florida and the Philippines. The black legend that the British brought in as they were colonizing this country was everything was bad about Spain. All they cared about was God, gold, and glory. The black legend has conditioned the way we look at this. Suppose we look at a different way, and Georgia tells us a very different way to do that. The governor of, of Spanish, Flor of La Florida, in 1605, after the mission was, was going on a while, and St. Augustine warned everybody, the native communities that we are conquering are different than all the ones in New Spain. And this has kind of been lost in the conversation of the black legend. Now, what's that mean? Now, let me just take a, a second here. The documents call it La Florida. And that St. Augustine goes, goes across uh, uh, to Tallahassee. For a while, it went up into South Carolina, but after 21 years, Santa Elena fell. And that, so that Spanish uh, area is La Florida. Now, I have a, I'm not going to call it that today. I'm going to call it Spanish Georgia, Florida, because I'm really talking about the Georgia part of this. And I have tickets to the game in Gainesville, the Georgia, Florida game. And they, the Bulldogs have not lost when I've attended one of those games. So what I really want to talk about, I'll call it Georgia, Florida history. What I'm really talking about is Bulldog history. This is the Georgia coast, and I want to be, be clear about that. Now, the key thing that the governor Ibarra was talking about in 1605 at St. Augustine was conquest by contract. And this didn't happen anywhere in New Spain. What this meant is conversion to the Catholic faith and to the Spanish empire is voluntary. Nobody is drafted into that. They have to make an explicit commitment to join up. And it's a very formal ceremony. And what they're agreeing to, what's happening here, the Spanish needed the Indians. If you look at the Florida Peninsula, it doesn't have the riches that Spain was looking for. Why did they care about it? They cared about it because it protected the treasure fleets, taking the stuff out of Central America and going to Europe. And as long as nobody cared, they left it alone. But when France decided they cared and wanted to raid those ships, the Spanish came in. But what they brought were sailors and soldiers. They didn't bring farmers. And St. Augustine could not make a living on its own without the indigenous community behind it. And the indigenous community behind it in Georgia and Florida, all they had to do was look inland. Look at what has happened the last 25 years since DeSoto was there. The towns are falling apart. There's new disease. We don't trust our leaders. Our magic is falling apart. We're in trouble. 
let's find a better way to do it. So what, what did this contract that I'm talking about actually say? Three things. We promise mutual defense to each other. We promise, we, the indigenous side, promise obedience to the king of Spain as amplified by the local governor. And we promise that we will receive missionaries and accept the schooling that they teach. And this, run back, this is a formal ceremony. And it takes place in the council house of the local tribe that is there. And should they agree to these conditions, the native community will come forward and shake the hand of the governor, in effect, shaking the hand of the king of England, and put a cross right in front of their council house, their key institution. Yes, we want to receive the friars. Now, many of them did, like on St. Catharines, but a bunch of them didn't, like the Calusa and in Apalachicola. They didn't want to do that. They didn't want to surrender that kind of authority. And so they just bowed out. So you've got a split in the mission system in Spanish Florida that didn't happen anywhere else in New Spain. It created a unique hybrid on the Georgia coast. You have the Franciscans coming in. Amy Bushnell has written that the mission was not a theocracy. It was not a religious mission. It was an entirely functioning native town, and it was run by those indigenous leaders that they decided on their own. And John Worth chimed in, the Franciscans have to be looked at as the Peace Corps of the 16th century. They, were, they weren't the leaders. They were kind of down the food chain, but what they were trying to do in their own mind is broker a way where this indigenous community can stay intact. And of course, the Spanish wanted to stay intact so they'd support the Spaniards and give them something to eat. Totally different situation than we can see anywhere else across the board. Now, that's fun history. Everything I've told you is from what we can read in the documents, and fortunately reread in the documents, once you know some of the archaeology, and the archaeology itself. But it's incomplete. What's it missing? Well, what's it's missing? Look in this face. This is as close as anybody's going to get to looking in the face of a 400-year-old Wally Indian. Look at that. And look at that. And look at that. What these are, are indigenous 400-year representations of the community, the Wally community that's living at this mission. And where, what were they? They're, the, they're part of the 14 stations of the cross inside the Franciscan church. The 14 stations of the cross are universal in Franciscan churches, and what they do is document the last year of the life of the last day of the life of Jesus Christ. So you have these Indian faces looking down where these masses are going on and everything else Franciscan is going on. And the question is, how do we hear their stories? How do we hear their forces? Everything I've talked about so far is good archaeology, but it's Euro-American history that we just didn't know before. Well, there are two ways. We can learn more from the archaeology, but we can also learn a lot more from the descendant communities. How do we do that? Well, there's a there's a change in history that's been going on for a while, but it's particularly pointed now. This is a book that was just published this year <clears throat> by Ned Blackhawk. He's a Western Shoshone Indian. I work out in Western Shoshone territory out West, but he's written this book. He is not only a tribal member, he also has an endowed chair in history at Yale University. 
And so he's got quite a following. And this new book, The Rediscovery of America, what he's actually doing, read the subtitle, it's an unmaking of U.S. history because, because Professor Blackhawk said, you can't understand the evolution of modern America if you don't have Indian components to it. And he was particular, he went further and he said, and how do we do that? What we do is make a distinction between survivance and survival. And in doing this, he's drawing upon another Native American scholar, uh, Gerald Visinor, Visinor uh, who was at Berkeley for a long time. Survivance is different than survival. Survival is what you do to get through a pinch in a hurry. You don't give much thought to the future because you're caring about today. Survivance is a different strategy. It's survival with an attitude that we are here in a place, there's nobody, we're not gonna make people feel guilty about it. We're not gonna be victims. We are gonna get through this. And it's not just about survival or endurance or mere response. We have our social agency. We can find a way through this and we will. We're not passive, we're active, and we're gonna make our own plans for the future. Now, what Blackhawk is arguing is there are multiple cases of this in the Native American past that we have flat out ignored in our rush to write our own Euro-American history. The Mississippian people of the Georgia coast knew they were in trouble. There's the term, the Mississippian shatter zone for this part of central Georgia, where things are just falling apart. After DeSoto, disease is coming in, there's disruption, there's mistrust of the native leadership. The Mississippian magic just isn't working anymore to cure those diseases, there's drought. Survivance <coughs> is what happened on the Georgia coast and it's survival with an attitude. Now, how's that work? Well, there is American antiquity is the most important archeological journal in the new world. And if you go back to last October and pick up an American antiquity, what you'll see is a council house, a Creek council house from Oklahoma. Now, remember I said that the, the conquest uh, part by contract involved native leaders walking out and saying, we welcome the new world and we're gonna put a cross up here and invite the Franciscans in to share it with us. Well, there's an article that's in this volume. Two of the authors are sitting in this audience uh, next to each other, of course. Uh, but what Victor and the rest of the group did was pull together a group of really good Georgia archeologists and really smart Native American people to look at a fallacy in American history, democracy. Now, how, how more sacred are we gonna get in something that we want to claim as US Americans than the origins of democracy? It came from Western civilization and it just went out to the rest of the world. What Victor and the others do in this article is say, that's not true. There are episodes that we can demonstrate from Georgia history that show that democracy has been in operation for a long time here. And what they do is look at the history of the council houses, the kind I've been talking about where they come out in the, in the contract. They can track not very far from here, council houses going back 1500 years. And what their argument is, is this council house is a material manifestation where the active participants, men and women, thrash out what is good for their group and then act on it. And they call it one of the most enduring and inclusive democratic institutions in the world. Now, I have to say, that's a great hypothesis. 
uh, and and I'm I'm on board with it. But more importantly, for my argument here, that's survivance. That is an idea that maybe we can trace 1,500 years in the state of Georgia. And here, here's their quote saying exactly what I just summarized. The council house is the key to it. We can talk about democratic ideas and stuff. They're talking about democratic institutions in the ground that archaeologists can see. And the most dramatic one of the seat of Muscogean democracy, we can all go to it. It's at San Luis in West Florida, uh, uh, in Tallahassee. They have a council house that is sitting right opposite the Spanish mission that we can go in and there's a little bit of a debate about how many thousand people could actually sit inside this democratic group and argue and agree about what to do. So I'm, I'm making the case here that, that the article that these guys have done that I think is going to be very significant and just came out last year, it's survivance in action. And what it's showing, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm perverting it into my own argument, but what we have at Mission Santa Catalina here in Georgia is the Franciscans taking ideas that are 500 years old. They were founded in the 12th century. And the indigenous Muscogians, the Wally, are taking ideas that might go back a thousand years before that. And they're signing a contract. They both need each other in a big way. And this is how they got it done. And it was very successful. And that's where the archaeology comes in. Just look at this. We know, not just the archaeology, but we know from the records, there were literally hundreds of baptisms and conversions and Christian burials that took place at Santa Catalina, Catalina de Wally while they were operating. They were the breadbasket of, of Spanish Georgia, Florida, uh, they were basically feeding St. Augustine by the end of the 16th century. They were involved in global commerce. If you look at the artifacts that are in this show, they come from around the world. The beads, there are medallions pictured in here that not only come from the Vatican, they were probably blessed by the Pope before they got here. There is more, let me just not let that go quite yet, there is more 16th and 17th century Franciscan religious paraphernalia that comes out of Mission Santa Catalina than from every other Spanish mission in this country. It's unheard of. And we didn't know about it until we were doing the archaeology. High standard of living. We know that from the archaeology, too. When the governor of Spanish Florida gets out of St. Augustine, and makes the rounds over a year to check. He goes out to Tallahassee. He comes up here to uh, up to St. Catherine's Island. The best dinner he ever had that year was on St. Catherine's Island. They were so well furnished with things to eat. Their standard of living was so high, far higher than anywhere else in Spanish Florida. And they had an unparalleled literacy rate now think about this. When the Spanish come in, they they do the contract. The local Wally agree to we we accept instruction, and part of that instruction is how to do the catechism, and the catechism is done in Spanish. There we now know from new historical research very recently, the literacy rate in the Spanish missions of Georgia was unbelievable. Most people could read, many could write Spanish, and the Mikos were so good at this that what they were doing is writing letters to each other in their native language. There, I, there is not a case that I'm aware of, and I don't think it exists, anywhere in the world where neophytes, as part of a religious system like that, have achieved that level of literacy. Uh, this is this was just found out a couple of years ago uh, with a rereading of the documents, and I, I just find it extraordinary. So to me, this is survivance in action. It shows us how indigenous institutions and Franciscan 
institutions, they were almost made for each other. And it was incre incredibly successful. And a lot of it revol revolved around the council house. We haven't found them on St. Catharines, or at least one, maybe two, but we just haven't, haven't been lucky enough there. Okay, friends, unique in the world. We also found out that didn't work at all with the Jesuits. Jesuits got there first. They were there for a while and left accounts. Oh, Jesuits. Jesuit order was only found about, founded about a quarter century before St. Augustine. They're brand new. And this is a product that comes out of what's going on in the Catholic Church. And when they came to Georgia, this was their very first effort in missionization anywhere in the world. And it wasn't a good one. Their accounts, and you can read these for yourself, but basically what they're saying is these Indians are all over the land. They don't settle down. They won't talk to us. They don't have anything to eat. They're a joke. The same group, the same islands, the same indigenous people were recorded 20 years later. What the Franciscans say? They have these great farms. They are feeding St. Augustine. They, they have a wonderful economy. Now, how do you square those two accounts? They're virtually the same time period, a quarter of a century apart. Well, part of the issue is what we know about the climate. And we know that during that Jesuit period, they had earth, no earthly way of knowing this. This was the worst drought over about 20 years of the 16th century. So what the indigenous communities were doing is having to go to their backup strategies when the corn wouldn't work. And they, didn't, they weren't anywhere to be found, but what the Franciscans were seeing instead were beastly people who didn't deserve to become Catholic. Now, the Franciscans came in 15, 20 years later. They all shared the same goals. What are we up, up about as, Francis, as Catholic missionaries? We're going to save the souls. That's the first thing we do. And the way we do it is somehow convert these indigenous people to getting on board to save their souls. But they, I call them theovisions, Franciscans call them theovisions. They couldn't be more different. Now, I didn't know much about the Jesuits when we were working on this. And uh, I got hold of a friend of mine, Charlie Poulter. We'd worked on, he was a professor at the University of Arizona, uh, but he was also a Jesuit priest. And I laid out the St. Catherine stuff. And if, if Father Poulter were here, what he would do is probably wear his cowboy hat and probably drive his VW bus. But what he would do is tell you there's a reason why that didn't work. And the first reason is, why do we have Jesuits to start with? And it was a time of upheaval in the Catholic Church. And what they were doing is requiring a letter of obedience to the Pope. And not only in 1533 did they have to do it, they ha still have to do it every month. And the implication of that comes out that Catholics must be exactly the same all around the world. They can't look like Lutherans. They have to be exactly the way the Pope says. So that's what led the Jesuit superior in Spanish Florida to call the whole thing, this is literally a quote, a large pile of sand full of rivers. And what he added was what I just said. These people are so beastly, they don't deserve conversion. They're like animals. And this is not for the society of Jesus. So. The Jesuits withdrew, and of course, the Indians voted with the feet. They weren't going to be part of this ridiculous thing for 10 years. So what we have on the Georgia coast is a conflict between ways of looking at it, the black robes and the brown robes, who came in later. Both were martyred on the Georgia coast for different reasons. And that's so that we wanted to look at that a little bit more. Now, we also found something else out. 
I didn't know anything about Franciscans. I wasn't raised that way, uh, but it was interesting archaeology for sure. How do we find out? Well, I didn't know anything until Father Conrad Harkins showed up, and we were pinched for money, and so we did a thing called Earth Watch that anybody can go on a dig, you know, uh, team sport, uh, as long as you're willing to pony up the bucks to help pay for the dig, and so we did that for a couple of years, and the Franciscan order ponied up. He, Father Conrad had taken vows of poverty. He didn't have any money, but the Franciscan order had a lot of money. And so they paid us a thousand bucks if we'd take Father Conrad with us on St. Catherine's as part of our crew. Now, you have to think about this. This is back in the 80s. Times were different and archaeological digs were a whole lot of fun. It was one big party and we could get away with it as long as we work hard during the day. So the last thing we wanted was a Franciscan friar as part of our dig on St. Catherine's. Well, it turned out Father Conrad was a marathoner and he became, as it showed, a pretty good excavator as well. He worked hard, but the important part for us, he said, don't you realize the importance of the site you found in Franciscan history? Two friars were killed here cause of the Georgia martyrs, five Georgians killed in 1597. I want to be and share that experience where they were. So Father Conrad said the first mass on our archaeological site in 400 years. And he was bringing this Franciscan history that is pretty much, to me, had been just dead in the, in the archives in a real way back to me. So Father Conrad helped us dig the convento, the friary. And it looks like this. It's the opposite side of the plaza from the church, right where it ought to be. There are two buildings here, actually. Uh, and no question, this is where the friars were living at Mission Santa Catalina. And I just had all kinds of questions. I didn't get it. How is it that thing, that white thing up in the corner? That's a well. Now, why would you have a well next to where you live when there's a hole? They've got a dam down here with a freshwater lake. Why would you bother doing that? And why are the rooms so small? And why do you have these weird features in the floor? And where's the kitchen? How do they do all this stuff? So I had Father Conrad. Uh, we, we were working through all this. And he finally looked at me at one point and just said, boy, you really don't know anything about Franciscans, do you? And I said, well, no, no, I, I don't. Uh, I know how to dig. And he said, but didn't you work with Margaret Mead? the most famous anthropologist of the 20th century. And I said, yeah, yeah, I worked with Dr. Mead for about six years. And he says, well, if Dr. Mead, as an anthropologist, had a question about some of the primitive societies there in the South Pacific, what would she do? And I said, well, she'd, she'd go and participate in observation. She'd live with them and experience the life that they're living and gradually try to understand what was going on. And so Father Conrad's line was that you've got to study us like any primitive religion and do exactly what Margaret Mead did. He was the professor, he's a professor of history at St. Bonaventure University, but he also ran the Franciscan program there. He says, you need to come and live with us for a while. I have a hundred retired Franciscans living there. Bring your questions to them and see what kind of answers you get. And so I did. I went up to St. Bonaventure and lived for a while and did my Margaret Mead thing. And the answers, of course, just started pouring out. The reason you've got a well there is I found out the first day when I walked into my cell, my tiny little room explaining what's going on here. And there, to wash, there are three fountains. There's hot water and there's cold water and there's holy water. And there's no way they could have used the water for the rent. They had to have their own special well. So gradually, as, as we came through it, I started learning, huh, uh, I'm not, I'm learning, I'm a slow learner, but uh, I'm starting to get it. Well, as it turned out, we've worked with four different bishops of, of Savannah, uh, of the diocese. Uh, Father Hartmeyer is the third. He is a Franciscan. And he came and he joined us. They all 
have. We've had masses said by four different bishops at that site. He joined the dig, and not only did he want to come and he said a mass, but if you look at this, he wasn't just talking, he was listening. And what the Franciscans were hearing was different things about their order, the way it operated 300 years ago, than what they were told in their recorded history. And so at St. Bonaventure, you can go get a master's degree in Franciscan history, but you have to go on an archeological dig first to do it. They were really convinced of the value of this. This is just taken earlier this year. This is uh, Father Parks, uh, who is the new bishop, the fourth one we've worked with in Savannah. And what he's doing is last spring saying mass on this archeological site And it, I, I ended up working a lot with the American Academy of Franciscan History. And they were fascinated both ways, what they could tell us and what, what we could tell them. And they decided it was so important in the church history that they asked, can we come and have our board meeting on the island where Mission Santa Catalina, you found, there were two friars killed there. And we're starting up something to recognize that five on the Georgia coast. Can we just meet there and talk about, and you teach us and we'll teach you. And on, on the right, you'll see what, how they see St. Catherine's Island. Looking in an aerial photograph, and actually my wife came up with this first, but the Franciscans agree with her. It's shaped just like the Virgin Mary. And it's such a special Franciscan place. They came and sp spent several days uh, on the island, enjoying it. Of course, they said a mass. And if you look at this, uh, you'll see a couple of picture in the people in the room are in this picture. But look at those palm trees that Rice planted. Immediately behind those is where the two Franciscan friars were killed in 1597. And what they're doing is praying for the souls of those friars. Now, we had a crew, you know, archaeological crew. We all stayed there. And we had a guy uh, who was part of the conversation uh, named Tormod Christensen. <laughs> and Tormod was, you know, was part of this. Uh, and he said, you know what I don't get, fathers, is how come the Franciscans can't stand the Jesuits? You're all Catholics. And Father Jack, uh, who, who's here, said Tarmod, aren't you from Norway? Yes, Father. How do you feel about the Swedes? You're all Scandinavians. And, and Tarmod's answer, I didn't know it was that bad. <laughs> so we ended up working through all of this and it came out what their argument was. And it's exactly what I've told you. Uh, if you know a Jesuit, you know everything there is to know about the Jesuit order because of the letters of obedience. And they said, and what you should know, and I, I weighed in at this point and said, but there's so much we're finding in the archaeology that does not agree with what you're telling me Jesuit uh, Franciscans believe. How come there are 432 people buried beneath the floor of that church in a way that is totally un-Franciscan. The Franciscan way is to bury in the, the burial of Jesus Christ in a simple shroud, perhaps a shroud pin. Keep it simple, keep it about poverty. But what we're finding, what we found when we worked through there is the thousand year old belief, Muscogean belief, you really can take it with you and you need it grave goods. Now, how do you justify those two philosophies with each other? And we had several others, but we this was our argument over dinner the whole time we had the Franciscan conference there. And finally, uh, uh, Fa Father Jack said, you have to understand, we're not the Jesuits. We do not believe in a very rigid, every Christian must be the same thing around the world. What we believe, our primary goal is to save souls. 
is to go out to people and make an argument where we can save their souls. And he said, sometimes we call ourselves amiable anarchists. And what that means is we will break every rule in the book as long as we can bring our congregation along to the afterlife. Huh, that's a big difference. So we also found if you pick up, well, it's even mentioned in the exhibit here, the conventional wisdom has always been the Juanillo Revolt of 1597, when those friars were killed, two on St. Catharines, five on the Georgia coast, they were murdered. And it was considered to be, oh, this is just exactly what you expect. It's what you, we saw in the American Southwest with the Pueblo Revolt. Now, I've excavated missions in New Mexico, and this is a very real thing. The Pueblo Revolt took place in 1680. St. Catharines was abandoned three weeks later. Coincidence? Don't know. But we do have a pretty good idea of what caused the Pueblo Revolt. This, this is a painting by Diego Romero, who's a Cochiti Pueblo artist. And what he's showing is how they felt about that revolution. They were not asked to come into those missions. The missionaries moved in without permission. And in 1680, they finally had had it. They killed one out of four Spaniards within what is now the state of New Mexico and drove them out for a dozen years. The most successful American Indian revolution in the history of this country. Here's the way at, at uh, Hopi they commemorated. This is called a priest killer Kachina doll. And you see exactly how they feel about that episode. Or in California, where I, I grew up in the California missions working on archaeology there. Father Sarah, Junipero Sarah, was made a saint. It's been four or five years now. And the uprising in Indian country in California was unbelievable. They called it Auschwitz with roses. And they called them death camps. And as soon as Father Sarah became a saint, his statues were trashed all over the state of Florida, and many had police guards to protect them. That's how they felt about the Franciscan background there. Now, the story I've told you is a very different Franciscan indigenous archaeology story, and the, friend, and the diocese, uh, the bishop, uh, Bishop Parks, is telling me, look out in the next three, four, five years, you may see the cause of the Georgia martyrs springing up at the Vatican. It's already there. They've, Father Conrad made the case largely based on archaeology. And as we go back to what John Worth said, these guys were like the Peace Corps. They weren't in charge, and they were trying to facilitate a very difficult transition into a new world. And the cause of the Georgia martyrs You'll see it if you look, springing up all over Georgia. The bottom painting appears in Dahlonek in the church in Dahlonega, Georgia. And Bishop Park, if you can see it in this one, there's a statue that is now in Darien. And he is telling us, don't be surprised if you see an elevation to sainthood of the Georgia martyrs within a matter of, within our lifetime, which would be unheard of given the, the history of the way things do that. So what I'm getting at is this is a way to put history into the active voice. This is a painting that was just done a couple of years ago by Richard Scott. It's now hanging in the cloisters uh, uh, in the Sea Islands. We work together on this. And this is as close as we can come up to what Mission Santa Catalina would have looked like in its prime. What I would hope is 10 years from now, if we were all sitting in this same room, I could point up 10 things that are wrong with this. This is a conversation that's still going on. But as I say, it's history. This is as literal as we could paint it. And we just hope it's wrong in the future. History in the active voice. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. I'm happy to walk around um, and hand off the microphone to anyone who might have a question. All right. Thank you. How, how many Franciscans were thought to have been assigned or uh, living there, and how many non Franciscan Spanish uh, citizens were in the. I can't give you the exact numbers, but uh, uh, from St. Augustine, but I can tell you they're a minor fraction. We're, we're talking at, at its peak, the mission system may have had 35,000 uh, neophytes involved, spread over 44 Spanish missions, but none of those missions had more than two. Most had only one. And some were visitas where they didn't have any, uh, and they they actually had to come and, and and visit that. So the numbers of the Franciscans are vanishingly small that were in, involved here. And to me, the the trick on this is in understanding what the historians are telling us about the the re readings of the document. It just makes no sense. You look at a place like St. Catherine's. You've got one at most two. Franciscans, how are they going to shove around a thousand people and 300 of those are warriors? There's something different going on. And I think that uh, conquest by compact is, is the answer. The Franciscans are there, but they are second ranking citizens in that community. Any other questions? Thanks, that was terrific. Uh, so if this, um, if the martyrs were killed for different reasons than what we saw in the West and in California, why were they killed? Wait a minute, say that again? The martyrs in Georgia, the five, why were they killed if it was different oh, from the West okay. and California? That's, that's a good question, and I skipped over that. Uh, Michael Francis is a pretty well-known historian who's worked a lot uh, on, the, on the anniversary of St. Augustine, but Michael came to the dig and we were going through the old stories about the Juanillo revolt. And he said, there's just something wrong here. And so what he did was go back to the original documents and retranslate everything. And what has happened there is the account, and it'll be the account that has already been presented to the Vatican, that the friars were killed because they were meddling, trying to keep plural marriage out of the system, which is probably true at some point. But this was a secondhand account that has been handed down as dogma, really, until fairly recently. And what Michael found is what actually happened, and he uses the archaeology to back this up, too. What this is, is a rivalry between the people who took the convent and agreed through this, and there are lots of tribes who didn't. And as time goes on, and so you're 30, uh, three, four decades into the Franciscan system, all of a sudden, it's really paying off for the Mission Indians uh, in all, all the reasons I mentioned. And it's not paying off for the ones who didn't. So it looks right now like it's the tribes who are on the outs came in and were so jealous that not only did they kill the five friars, which could be understandable either way, but why did they destroy the entire villages and take it out on the people who were living there? And so I think Michael's got a pretty strong argument that this was indigenous competition for the new way. And the, the people who took the survivance options were thrown against the people who took their survival audience options. I feel like there was a question. Thanks, Dr. Hurst. Uh, you're uh, mentioning uh, consultation with dissent communities and have given us a nice story of uh, the consultation with uh, Franciscan orders. How about with Muskogee Creek Nation and Native nations that that might might argue that they have they have descendant community interests in St. Catherine and other uh, coastal island sites too. Yeah, those those conversations are going on right now. 
and thanks largely to the University of Georgia. Uh, I mentioned that when I made the phone call to Bishop Lessard in 1981, we had all of us assumed the Wally tribe was extinct, tracked them down to as, as the Spain. There, there are four Mission Santa Catalina de Wallis that we can track back to St. Augustine. They went to Cuba, and there's been a little of research showing that there's some of the Wally names that, that persisted in the baptism records until the 19th century. We all, at the time, considered that's the end of the Wally people. And what we're seeing right now, and, and a lot, lot of it, I come back to the article uh, that, that, uh, that Victor did. Now there are re-examining the foundations of that. And we ha we've, we've had conversations, there are repatriations that are taking place, but that next step, it'll be fascinating to see, but it hasn't happened yet. All right, if there are no more questions. Um, I invite everyone to join us in the hallway. We have some light refreshments that we are serving. Um, I also encourage you to check out um, our exhibit in the Hargard Gallery. It will be on display through December of this year. And if you're interested in more events related to St. Catharines Island, we will be having a family day here on September 30th. It's in partnership with the Archaeology Lab, um, and there will be a lot of fun activities that you can do. And of course, if you ever want to keep up with our events, uh, just head to our website, libs.uga.edu. That's where all of our events are posted, and you can join us for wonderful lectures just like this one. So thank you so much and have a great night.